Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I just thought James was a difficult book. Peter <laughs> has been a job, amen. But it is such an amazing <coughs> book. This book is written in a way that you and I can read it and we can say, okay, that applies to me. I can see that applying to me. This applies to me. This is, this is for me. And then every now and then you'll see something, the way it's phrased or the way it's worded, and then you'll say, no, that's for tribulation. That's for the tribulation. That's for the tribulation. And then you'll read it again. No, that's for me. And then you read it. No, that's tribulation. And then it hit me. What a blessing. What a blessing that is because we can read it today and we can draw application for our life. We can grow in grace and knowledge and we can get principles to live by. And at the same time, when we leave here, this same word will be left for those going through the tribulation. And they'll be able to read it and they'll be able to glean from it and help them know how they are to function and navigate through their time period as well. So what a blessing that is. That's an amazing book. No other book can do that. I mean, seriously, if you stop and think about that, it's, it's just an amazing book. But anyway, uh, we are studying in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I did give you the outline. Uh, we started talking about rejoice and salvation in chapter 1. And you'll see why, hopefully, tonight before we're done, we talked a lot about salvation. The first point, under Roman numeral one, rejoice in salvation was the salutation. And in the salutation, uh, I gave you the greeted, the greeter, and the greetings. And then we started talking about salvation. And that was verses three through 12. I, ch I changed the outline just a little bit, three through 12. And we made it down to about verse six. In verse three, we talked about the praise. <coughs> we should praise him for his mercy and his goodness, amen. Talked about the position in, in verse 4. Uh, we, our possession is eternal, amen, to inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, amen. And then the letter C was the power, verse 5, were kept by the power of God. And then 6, uh, we was dealing with 6 when we closed. It says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And we, we, we dealt with that last week and I gave you a lot of verses there. Now, we're going to deal with the letter D, pleasure. In verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, and it will, at the judgment seat of Christ, amen, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, we should rejoice in our salvation. That's what verse 6 told us. It says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. We can be going through troubles and trials and and a lot of us are. We are. A lot of us have health issues and we have this issue. We've got things we worry about and kids we worry about and family we worry about. We've got a lot of things on us, but we still can come together, rejoice, and worship the Lord because He's so good to us. We know He saved us from hell. Amen? So we have the ability to come together and rejoice even when we're suffering, even when we're going through troubles and trials because we know it's not going to last forever. It's just going to be a short season. Amen. Now, uh, but we should rejoice. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice <coughs> evermore. And where it talked about for a season there in verse 6, uh, in Peter's mind, it was a short season. Remember the early church thought the Lord was going to come back and set up the kingdom. Almost immediately, because Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, prepared to come back. So the early church was looking for him to come back almost immediately. So that's a short season. Well, we're in the church age, and we realize it's been 2,000 years, but as, and as we study, we realize that, hey, we are at the end of this thing, 
And it's just a short season until it's coming. Right. And for a tribulation saint, he can read it and the tribulation is a short season if they can put up with that trouble. What a book. Right. What a book. You say, well, who does it actually doctrinally apply to? Tribulation. You say, how do you know that for certain? Look at the end of verse 7. At the appearing, appearing of Jesus Christ. Appearing. When does Jesus appear? The rapture? No. We disappear. He steps out on a cloud and calls us out of here. The world don't see him. The appearing of Jesus Christ is when he comes back to rule and reign at the end of the tribulation. So you see, we can, we can apply this to us and we can see that, that, that we can learn some principles from that. But doctrinally, we can also see it's aimed at a tribulation saint. Now, uh, let's keep going here. Let's look at verse 7 again. It says, The trials of temptation of your faith. Now, the trials of temptation of your faith is not the faith that saves you. The trials of temptation is a faith that God can keep you, God can preserve you, God can give you the grace you need to make it through this day or this time or this trouble or this heartache or this situation. It's the everyday faith that trusts in Him. Do you know what the biggest temptation is today for a Christian? To quit. To just throw in the towel. Did they lose their salvation? No. Did they lose their faith? Yeah, they lost faith that Jesus was going to take care of them. They lost faith that it was worth it. They lost faith that, pay, that, that, that living for the Lord is better than living for the world. That the fight is worth it. The biggest temptation today for a Christian is just walking away. Lay down the Bible. Quit witnessing. Quit reading. Quit praying. Quit serving. Amen. That's the biggest temptation that you're faced with. And again, I'd mentioned when you're tested and tried <coughs> and see whether or not past the test, they received gold. That gold mentioned there for a Christian in the church age, it makes us think about the judgment seat of Christ. Right. Where our works are judged, not our soul. Amen. Now verse 8, Whom having not seen, you love. Anybody in here ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ? Yet each and every one of us is gathered here in His name. We're here to hear about Him. We're here to learn about Him. We're here to draw closer to Him. But no one here has ever seen Him. To the world, we're crazy. We love and follow a man we've never seen. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. <laughs> That's us. You know, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're trusting what this book says. You say, Preacher, how, how, how do you know that's, that, that what that book's telling me is right? Well, for one thing, because CBN and CNN and ABC and uh, Fox and Newsmax and all of them, they don't talk about this book. They avoid this book. The world don't talk about this book. Hollywood tries to pervert this book. Amen. Uh, everybody seems to attack this book. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that's usually a good indication you're on the right track. If the world embraces it, chances are it's wrong. That sounds terrible, but that's about the truth of it. Who's the God of this world? So if the world embraces it, it means the devil likes it. That's good to think about that. Now there's enough, there's enough uh, that has been fulfilled prophecies from this book to prove it's the Word of God. No other book can do it. But anyway, let's keep going here. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, that does not sound like Pauline epistles, does it? The end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Like if you don't keep the faith, you don't get it. Like if you don't endure to the end, you don't get to keep it. 
But what it's actually saying, the end of your faith, again, is not faith in salvation. It, it's, uh, it says, even the salvation of your soul. Let me see how I worded it here, because I worked on this some today. And it says, uh, the end of your salvation is not a, it's not talking about uh, what you've worked for. It's the outcome of your salvation. For a Christian today, our salvation is a done deal. When we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, what's the outcome of that faith? Eternal salvation. The end of my faith is I'm going to be saved. But, but have I got my full salvation today? No. Remember, our salvation is in part where our soul is saved and sealed now. But this flesh is not saved. It's not going to be saved until the Lord comes back and I get a glorified body. This mortal must put on immortality. You see what I'm talking about? This corruptible must put on incorruption. All right? And we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye when He comes back. Amen? Verse 10. Here is a good verse. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Those Old Testament prophets were speaking. I uh, mean, Brother Ryan was talking about it. Some of them were pinning stuff down and they didn't even know what they were saying, but they knew there was something in it. David wrote Psalms. And you know what David wrote in Psalms? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Dogs have compassed me about. Talked about his bones being out of joint. Now the bone was broken, but his bones were out of joint from the beating and hanging on the cross. David described the crucifixion of the Savior in Psalms 22. David had never been crucified. David had never been tortured like that. So what David was writing as he was led by the Holy Spirit, he didn't fully comprehend. But he knew there was something there. He just didn't see it yet. Okay, He didn't fully understand it. Now watch this. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Those Old Testament prophets, they searched the scriptures and they dug for it. Who prophesied of the grace that should come upon you. They were saved in the Old Testament by works and faith. And every now and then they'd get a glimpse of grace that was coming to us through Jesus Christ. And they was like, what is this? See, they understood Old Testament salvation. They understood the law. They understood uh, the ceremonies of, and the, 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 the burnt offerings and the wave offerings, the heave offerings, the sacrifice offerings. They understood that. Temple worship and the traditions. They understood that. But they didn't know what it was picturing. Are you with me? They understood they had to do this in order to fellowship with God. They had to do this in order to be right with God. But they also knew that this has to be a picture of something different. <coughs> this has to be something, there's something to what we're doing. But they couldn't grasp it. See, that was revealed to Paul in the New Testament who turns around and reveals it to us. See, they were searching and looking for an answer, uh, but they didn't fully understand it. Verse 11, searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, there's a couple things in that verse 11 that, that I kind of want to deal with. They understood the mountain peaks of prophecy. They understood the overall big picture. They didn't understand the, the details. They understood that Christ was going to suffer and die. They did not understand the church and the body of Christ. They understood that he was going to come back and rule and reign. They seen the big picture. 
you say, well, preacher, you're teaching something new. No, I'm not. Clarence Larkin taught this clearly 120 years ago. Over 120 years ago, the church knew this. It was common knowledge in the church that in the Old Testament, they did not see the New Testament like we see it. They knew there was something there, but they didn't see it. They didn't see the church age. They didn't see the, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. They didn't see the mysteries that God revealed to Paul, Jesus revealed to Paul, that Paul revealed to us. They didn't see that. What they saw was a coming Messiah who was going to suffer. There's the first coming. And then it skipped the church age and they seen him ruling and reigning. There's the second coming. They didn't see the church at all. And that explains some things that helps us, it helps us understand some things as well. Um, look at the end of verse 11. It is testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, first coming, and the glory that should follow. There's the second coming the ruling and reigning. Christ in His glory, okay? So there it is. And let me, let me show you this. Turn to Acts chapter 1. You remember after Jesus suffered and He resurrected from the dead, He appeared to many of them before He ascended up. Look at Acts chapter 1. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, what did they ask? Will thou at this time, without now, at this time, restore again the kingdom of Israel? You know what they was looking for? They wasn't looking for the church age. They wasn't looking for the bride of Christ. They wasn't looking for the body of Christ. They wasn't looking for us. They weren't looking for Jew and Gentile being in one body, being called the, the, the bride of Christ. They were looking for Jesus to come back. And while he was here, they thought, are you going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to deliver us from the Romans? And are you going to put us in charge again? Are you going to rule and reign? That's what they were looking for. That's what they were, were, were thinking. Look at verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. Now the reason I read that verse is because let's go back to uh, when we get back into Peter, the next verse, it'll help you make sense of it. But before we do that, look at verse 11 again in 1 Peter. It talked about the Spirit of Christ which was in them. See that there? That's the Old Testament prophets talking about how they have the Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit could come on them and in them, in, in them, in the Old Testament. But the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Holy Spirit could leave them. They didn't have the promise of eternal security. They were not sealed to the day of redemption. They were not placed in the body of Christ. They were not part of the bride of Christ. Do you understand? That was Old Testament. And the Spirit could come on them, could come in them, and could leave them. Clear as bell. You say, I don't know about that. Then why did David say, why did David say for the Lord, ask the Lord in Psalm 51.10, that his spirit not depart from him. Why did why did he pray that your that the Holy Spirit wouldn't depart from him unless he could lose him? How many of you remember the story of Samson? Strongest man that ever was. You know what Samson did? He messed around with sin so much that the spirit left him. And if you remember, he jumped up off of Delilah's lap. She'd done played and braided his hair and cut it off and all that stuff. She'd give him a buzz cut. Woo! Some of this Washington Ghost stuff here. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> she doesn't give him a buzz. And he gets up and wished not the Lord had departed from him. But you know what happened before he died? He prayed and got it back. And he was able to push those pillars over and kill more of the Philistines of the enemy in his death than he did in his life. Amen. So there's, there's perfect pictures and illustration of the Spirit coming and leaving the man. In the New Testament, that's not going to happen. Once you get saved, you're sealed to the day of redemption with a promise that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Ain't that good? I know the context now, brother. <laughs> that was an awesome message. But anyway, let's keep going. Let's see, I was in verse 11 there. Oh my goodness, I am not even going to get close. You believe I actually thought I was going to finish this chapter tonight? Oh, me. <laughs> All right, now, remember what I showed you there in uh, Acts, and let's read verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did they minister. Unto whom it was revealed. The Old Testament prophets and priests and saints realized that they weren't just ministering to themselves, but to those coming down the road. Their posterity, the future, their offspring, us. Okay? It, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, amen, sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Now, they realized that it wasn't revealed to them what was going on and a lot of what they were doing they were doing because it, it was something that they needed to do for the picture they were doing. I, I can't explain it. I, clearly, I got it in my head. I can understand it. A lot of what I do sometimes I can't explain to my wife, but I do it because I want my children to see it, to follow that example. You see what I mean? I'm showing them something. Amen. A lot of times you may not say something, but you do stuff because you want to be the example they follow. Knowing that kids will do what you do, not what you say. Does that make sense? Everything they were doing in the Old Testament was a picture for us. You know what the Bible said in Galatians? Paul said that the Old Testament, the law, was our schoolmaster. What was the schoolmaster's purpose? To bring us unto Christ. So you go back and look at that Old Testament law. How about this? Just go back and look at the tabernacle. Everything in the tabernacle pointed to Jesus Christ. The offerings, the furniture, everything pointed to Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing. I'm not going to go through that. I spent 14 weeks just on the tabernacle. You ought to get that. Everything, everything pointed to Jesus Christ. Uh, how about this? Turn to Romans 15. Romans 15. I'm all over here, but... Romans 15, look at verse 4. Romans 15. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Everything in the Old Testament, all that they did, all that they went through, all that was written for our learning. They went through that stuff. They lived that stuff. They wrote that stuff. They talked about that stuff. They prophesied that stuff. And it was for us as well. Amen? Our learning. It was for them. They had to do the tabernacle stuff. They had to, they had to keep those sacrifices to stay in fellowship. But we see it We've got to accept Jesus Christ. They were picturing it so we could look at it and see it. Does that make sense to you? That make sense, brother? Did that come out of anything at all close to okay to, to make it sense? Uh, how about this? Turn to 
1 Corinthians. There's another verse here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, this is good. I didn't even think of this, but it's in the chapter, so I'm going to go ahead and read it too. 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse 1. I forgot about this. Here's a perfect picture. You remember when the children of Israel were walking through the wilderness? They were complaining. They were thirsty. They didn't have anything to drink. They thought they was going to die. They remember complaining against Moses. And God said, go smite a rock. And that rock will bring forth water. That literally happened. They lived that. But you know what that does to us? That sends us shouting. Why? Because we know Christ is the rock that had to be smitten. And we get that life-giving water. Amen. He said, the, remember what he said to the woman of the well? Amen. Now look at it. Chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were baptized of the Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat that same spiritual meat and did drink that same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, letting you know it was Christ, that followed them and that rock was Christ. Amen. They didn't know that. All they seen was Moses smite a rock and water come forth and they was able to drink and give to their families and water their cattle and their sheep and their herds. Amen. Now, what I was looking for is in verse 11 though. Now, all these things happened, happened unto them for examples and they were written for our Admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Uh, see that, that? So when someone says the Old Testament's not that important, they don't know what they're talking about. That Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. There's a lot of, there's, there's, there's more on the second coming of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament than they are in the New Testament. And if you're not reading the Old Testament, you're missing out on most of the doctrine on the second coming of the Lord. It's in the Old Testament. It's in picture, it's in type, and it's in prophecy. All in the Old Testament. And it said the angels there in 1 Peter 1 and 11, it's, or 12 there, it said the angels desired to look into this. It's almost like God didn't reveal His plan to them. It's like He kept it close to the vest. How many of you ever heard that? It's like He kept His plan close to the vest and the angels didn't even realize what the Lord was doing. For years at my house on the wall, it got taken down. We've got some uh, angels redone it and put some grandbabies up there, pictures and stuff now, which is perfectly fine. I, I enjoy that. But for years, there's one place on the wall, there used to hang a picture of uh, was supposedly Jesus Christ laying in the manger. And in the background, there's angels looking on with wonder in their eyes. Like, what's going on? Y you know what I mean? It's like the Lord did not reveal to the angels His plan of redemption. So they were looking on, watching it in awe and amazement as we live it. And the Bible does talk about us being uh, compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. It's like they're watching even though we have the Scripture, we can study it, and we can see His plan it's like he kept it from them. I don't fully grasp that. I don't fully understand that. But that's what it's implying. That the angels were looking in amazement. And we'll see a verse or two that kind of leads you to believe that's the way it is as well. Uh, thou, again, Acts 1-7. You say, well, I don't think that's right. Anybody in heaven should know. All right, go back to Acts again. Was Jesus God manifest in the flesh? Yes, yes He was. Is Jesus all-knowing? Omniscient? All-knowing, yes. Well, what does Acts 1-7 say? You know what Jesus told some of them one time? 
that he didn't have the answer. When Jesus was here, he chose not to exercise that divine side and he himself said he didn't have the answer. So if he didn't have the answer to something, I'm sure the angels don't have the answers to everything. Are you with me? It does make you think that. But anyway. Here's something else that's interesting. Daniel, you remember Daniel was writing and Daniel had those visions and dreams and he could interpret the dreams and visions of the king and stuff. Daniel, when he was doing writing, God told him to shut up the pages in the book that it wasn't to be revealed until the last time. Daniel was able to interpret dreams and prophesy things that we are living and going to see and is going to be in the tribulation. And was told to shut them up to the time of the end. There's things right now in this Bible you and I don't know. We don't even know is in there. We don't have enough sense. We haven't experienced some things yet to even know what to look for. But you let the Antichrist show up and you let famines hit and you let the persecution start. You let the pit be open and demons come out all over this world tormenting men. All of a sudden, we're going to understand a whole lot better some of this stuff. It's an amazing book. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It'll start making sense. Now, where now we always try to spiritually apply it or we always try to make a practical application and say it was for us and we practically apply it, doctrinally we're going to understand it better. Amen? We'll understand some of the things that went on in the Old Testament. I'm still wondering why he had him cut the hamstrings on some of them horses back there in the Old Testament. Amen. Some people say bestiality and you get into all that stuff. Well, there might be some truth to it, but there might be something else going on. We just don't know yet. He had a reason for them doing that. You say, preacher, if it's a cat, I'd understand that and just shoot it. You know, I wouldn't think nothing about it, but a horse? You know, well, why'd you do that to a horse? <laughs> you say, preacher, that's awful. That's terrible. I did that because my wife ain't in here. Uh, I, I was thinking about her. I accidentally ran over a cat today on the golf cart. It was down to the barn watering some goats and stuff and taking a horse kicked the side out of the barn and the goats got out yesterday so I fixed the side of the barn, went down there and put the boards and got everything fixed up and everything and make sure the fence is all right. Went down there today just to check make sure everything's still good and water the goats and stuff like that and there's cats down there at the barn. And the cats had got out and they loved getting under that golf cart. They love it. And I'm not a patient man when it comes to an animal ain't got no more sense to get under my feet or in my way. Always under your feet. I, I, every time I kick them, they go sailing, you know, and Andy fusses the whole time, you know. Uh, you know get off of me, you know. You're going to trip me and hurt me. There's things down here I don't want to fall on, and this thing's going to trip me up, you know. But anyway, we got in there, and I was going slow, and that stupid cat was just weaving right in front of me, and I just, I just looked away for a second and hurt me. It took off that away. And I just kind of giggled and kept going. <laughs> and Angie got mad at me because I didn't stop and check on me. She said, you might have broke his hip. I said, nope, run too fast. <laughs> well, you might have broke his foot. Good, you can't do nothing for it anyway. Maybe an hour to learn. You notice it ain't, it ain't weaving and bobbing no more. You know? <laughs> You say, preacher, I, mean, I don't know, just crazy stuff goes through your head even though you're up here with the open Bible and you're, you're still flesh. But anyway, we don't have all the answers. Angels look down, though, and they get to see a lot. They know more than we do, I am sure. But even they wonder at the plan of God. God's plan is so marvelous that even angelic beings are amazed at what He's doing. Could you imagine what the angels in heaven was actually thinking when Jesus came and took on this flesh? Especially if He didn't tell them that was His plan to take on flesh and then walk a perfect life 
Maybe they figured out that he'd come to suffer and die. Maybe they seen enough in the scriptures to know, but maybe it wasn't revealed to them yet. Maybe they were just as blind to God's plan as the Old Testament saints would have been. And then they seen him crucified. I'm sure that they probably understood that, but see him come back. It's amazing when you stop and think about it. God... His ways is higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. There's no way we can understand or even come close to comprehending how wise He is. And He, he, he does things for a reason. And everything He does is right. That's, that's, that's what's amazing. He never does anything wrong. It's always right. Well, that's why I'm looking forward to a glorified body. Everything I think will be right. I won't have to question it anymore. Is my thinking right? Am I off on this? Is Lord, is is that you telling me this? Lord, is that the devil? Lord, is that the world? That's just this old stinking flesh. You, you understand what I'm saying? Every thought will be right. Every desire will be right. Every want to be right. Because right now you can't trust even yourself. Amen. Oh, that's an amazing book. I know I'm out of time and I'll have to stop there, but is there any questions? Next week we'll move on to the next point and Lord willing, we will finish the chapter next week. <coughs> there was just a lot in there that was just wanting to make sure that you've seen it clearly. Let's all stand. No questions or comments.